Good afternoon, everybody. We are back here for discussing the session three of our event, uh, summary of outputs and uh, uh, guidelines. We have uh, prepared uh, among uh, the, uh, the first uh, session of today, and now uh, a quick uh, uh, sum up of uh, all the three uh, sub parts of our event from yesterday and today. So allow me to go through this uh, uh, draft uh, presentation. Uh, this uh, last part will be uh, more or less an open discussion where uh, uh, the speaker that uh, join and uh, the audience can uh, contribute uh, in trying to define preliminary uh, draft of the conclusion and the next steps and the guidelines for the community on remote sensing of marine litter. So allow me to make a quick sum up of the goals of uh, our event of these uh, last two days. We have covered a part one about the users and stakeholders needs and expectation in terms of monitoring uh, uh, marine litter and plastic, uh, marine plastic in particular, and for which application or services envisioned by these user and stakeholders. Part two, which was uh, yesterday, uh, uh, later afternoon and uh, this early afternoon uh, European time, we try to inform you about the state of the art capabilities and the limitation at the same time that the remote sensing tools, uh, meaning uh, from uh, ground cameras to drones, planes and satellites have in supporting the monitoring and the management of the issue of marine litter. And finally, <clears throat> we are now at the part three. Part three is trying to, uh, let's say, align uh, some of the um, users and stakeholders needs and uh, requirements and expectation with what is the current capability of the remote sensing tool and uh, uh, both yeah now and uh, uh, in the short and medium term. And finally, we would like to conclude by uh, gathering in an open discussion um, the, which are the next steps uh, to match the uh, technology capabilities required by the expectation and uh, needs of the uh, stakeholders and users. And of course, we would like to define some basic guidelines. Of course, it's not possible to define in a, such a short event and short discussion and preparation uh, guidelines for the next uh, decade. But this is something, this is a, should be seen like a seed of the discussion that we will have in the uh, months and years to come. So please try also to contribute on that. And uh, you have uh, um, received the, the link for the Padlet for the part three in the email when you register. So please use that one. And uh, we will try to monitor that uh, in order to uh, integrate uh, your comments, suggestions, inputs in our discussion. And of course, the, the vision, the, the, the ultimate vision that we have of this path that we start also with your contribution today is to uh, work under a, a mandate possibly of a United Nation Decadal Action in the frame of the Ocean Decade for Sustainable Development. So let me um, introduce and make a quick uh, uh, summary of the users and stakeholders that we involved uh, in the part one. We had a quite uh, diverse uh, pool of uh, stakeholders also intervening from the audience we had uh, defined here the main categories. So uh, we had policy making and gover governance, users and stakeholders, uh, both from the international scale. So we can think about the United Nations itself to regional scale, like program uh, from the United Nations ESCAP program or from uh, EU, Euro European Union um, uh, programs and, and agencies, uh, European Space Agency, for example to national scale like uh, country governments and local scale. For example, we had a contribution from uh, port uh, authorities. Um, another users is a monitoring agency. Uh, so like environmental monitoring agencies and uh, scientists, of course, these are users of the data generated for you know, uh, model, modeling, prediction, and uh, et cetera, like the transport modeling itself. And uh, of course, industry, private companies, this can be a very important element to add to the discussion and uh, to boost uh, the technology, 
push to boost services to boost a business application and of course finally a very important element is uh, uh, sorry a very important uh, users and stakeholders is also the citizen so uh, also uh, there will be people among you that can contribute because at the end you want to know what is the situation of the pollution and you want to contribute to that as much as possible not only by following policies and regulation but also being proactive in trying to limit that so some collection of uh, uh, expectation and needs uh, from uh, uh, the part one um, we have uh, uh, for example uh, data for monitoring and assessing uh, effectiveness of mitigation measurements this is something that encompasses basically uh, i would say uh, most of the users the need for mapping capabilities with potential layering of information with other variables and parameters like uh, population density uh, the mismanagement of the waste uh, uh, according to the area uh, known sources of uh, pollution and waste etc uh, we have uh, um, the expectation to be able to detect and identify uh, litter hotspot and accumulation zones, of course. Uh, so not only the single uh, element, single plastic item that can be done with certain platform, but also hotspot and accumulation zone, for example, floating in the, in the sea, in the coastal waters, or even in the ocean. Uh, identify the location, quantification, and identification of uh, polymers types. So certain application would like to have the discrimination of the polymers, uh, the request of generating uh, data time series uh, and the baselines against uh, which the time series want to be compared, feeding numerical models and support the validation and assessment uh, efforts uh, for, uh, via uh, modeling, computer modeling, so like transport modeling. Uh, and uh, finally, the one, sorry, that's not finally, that's the first slide. Uh, of uh, the expectation it needs, but one of those was uh, the request that uh, remote sensing data should be uh, fused, should should be harmonized and integrated with existing in situ data, so in situ ground data, in a way that remote sensing data can be so directly injected into uh, what is already existing in terms of monitoring services and application on the ground. Uh, other uh, expectation and needs uh, that we collected from the users and stakeholders is uh, the, uh, the need of standardized uh, of uh, the collected data for a seamless, comparable, and interoperable usage of those. So we want data that are collected and, uh, and, and presented and possibly published in a way that follows certain standards so every group can take this data in a way that does not need reprocessing or reconversion and everything. Everything is under the same standard and shared. Uh, more benchmarking about technology and data for having a comparison. Uh, some user asked for the identification of a steady litter deposit in coastal areas. Uh, we have seen, uh, for example, a presentation of, of uh, Caleb about uh, uh, detecting um, uh, dam site, uh, so waste area, legal or illegal, that could contribute to track sources where the marine litter to be waste is uh, also generated for a large part. Um, there is a need of synergy and fusion of data from uh, different remote sensing sources. So again, <clears throat> again sometimes uh, uh, we identify remote sensing only with satellites, but uh, we want to stress the concept that remote sensing is not only satellite, but is uh, drones, is a uh, uh, planes uh, is a different kind of platform with different kind of sensor and this should be uh, should work together and integrate the uh, data um, generated and fuse them to try to find meaning out of them in time and in space um, of course satellites are seen uh, by by the stakeholders as a, as a, as a preferred ultimate tool for uh, the overall littering problems uh, because of course of their capability to cover vast area from the ocean to even the land. But of course the drones uh, and the small, uh, say lower altitude platform are perceived at the moment as more suitable for a local application. For example, like we have seen for uh, 
uh, the port uh, application for a warning uh, uh, services for the navigation or the cleaning of the port itself. So these were a first overview about uh, uh, the expectation and the needs that we were able to collect uh, from uh, uh, these past two days. And on top of that, we already discussed uh, um, potential services. Services also seen as a potential uh, commercial application or business application. Um, one of the most general uh, potential service would be, of course, to uh, merge GIS information with the data points of money litter and their sources in order to uh, have a view, uh, follow the time evolution of uh, the waste pollution in the sea, in the rivers, and of course, also, as we discussed, uh, on the land close to water bodies. In this way, to try to better manage the waste and uh, to extract plastic litter, let's call them indicators or descriptors that can be relevant for decision making at many different level of stakeholders, like policymakers and authority, industrial entities, eh, in terms also of corporate responsibility of uh, uh, companies for their, their own pollution contribution, and of course, finally, citizen alike. Um, <clears throat> one of the services that came out was, for example, like I was uh, already anticipating, was uh, for port authorities. So warning to navigation on accumulation of debris, that can damage, for example, the propeller. Think about uh, lost derelict fishing net, the so-called ghost net, but also accumulation of, uh, of uh, litter mixed with algae that could indeed impact uh, the navigation. And of course, simply for keeping uh, the area where the boats are, where the boats had to lead in a, in a cleaning state. We have seen uh, from uh, uh, Aqualit, for example, there was uh, uh, the mentioning the uh, the need of uh, uh, and the potential service in detecting the, uh, pl the plastic littering result from uh, marine farming and aquaculture. So to monitor the contribution of the pollution, which reminds of the first ballot about, uh, uh, let's say, corporate responsibility about their own uh, generated pollution. Uh, we mentioned the possibility to have, uh, in terms of services, uh, uh, the generation of certification for plastic-free areas uh, where, for example, uh, seafood is collected. And we see food including uh, from fishes, uh, mussel, uh, uh, farming, and aquaculture. But even we saw uh, from uh, Vito Verdeglio in the, in, the, in the first day, the sargassum, which are used, that they have potential use on land uh, in many, uh, in different fields. Uh, and finally, of course, there is education. So, uh, the potential service would be to provide local development plans, including educational elements. Uh, regarding the part two, um, we have uh, uh, we have assessed the technology capability and R and D uh, at different level for different uh, uh, also application in that case. And here we have uh, tried to structure um, uh, the discussion per platform. It's very difficult to try to encompass and uh, and uh, summarize uh, all the technology capability. As you can imagine, this depends on the type, the kind of sensor, on what you indeed want to see, etc. So we try to uh, summarize first in terms of uh, platform. So let's say the level of remote monitoring uh, we can have, starting from uh, well platform that are at the ground at the surface. We still have remote sensing sensors. Uh, but uh, we are on the ground. So, for example, cameras uh, installed on bridges or in an arbor uh, platform that can see uh, the full arbor, like the lighthouse, or on the beaches or on boats itself. And in general, also, sorry, not in general, but also specifically could be even on uh, uh, um, maritime autonomous platforms. So in this case, we can have ad hoc sensors, eh? uh, dedicated highly performing because they are on the ground they can be accessed they can be maintained and uh, um, you can detect plastic litter uh, with uh, with the already uh, application uh, successful on that for example let me make uh, this uh, application example uh, there are already several application uh, able to detect the plastic items and identify as such 
that flows under bridges in uh, rivers uh, in a different part of the world already. With drones, drones uh, are the next uh, uh, level, we can say, of remote sensing. We are already going aerial here, so increasing our altitude from the surface. The drones has been uh, seen uh, as uh, ideal for uh, short range, uh, short observation times application. Uh, of course, their closeness to the target enables pattern recognition, uh, also with artificial intelligence, and uh, also capability to identify plastic items uh, at, the, at the very uh, small scale, like we have seen uh, in the presentation of uh, uh, Professor Topuzelis uh, this afternoon. And they also allow to uh, satisfy one of the requirements uh, I was mentioning before about possibly understanding the nature uh, and the composition of the litter itself uh, and even the material at certain level. And that is uh, the bullet to, uh, that is reported here. So in general, drones are seen very well suited for uh, coastal monitoring. Then we have the next attitude uh, stage of uh, platform uh, planes, airplanes. At the moment, they have been uh, less exploited due to uh, clearly cost limitation at the research level. So uh, flying a plane uh, costs quite a lot. You have to pay the pilot, you need to pay the fuel. So uh, for, uh, for the research stage as we are, planes has been uh, under exploited at the moment. But they look like a very potential uh, uh, very, very important, sorry, platform for monitoring uh, money litter as well also other form of pollution, by the way, because they are able to carry relatively heavier instrument than drones and uh, of course to fly more distance and so to have a larger ground view compared to drones. And finally, we get to the ultimate uh, uh, sensor in, uh, uh, and, sorry, platform in sense of uh, uh, remote sensing, which are satellites. And uh, we have seen a presentation yesterday uh, late afternoon. And here we report uh, some of this uh, uh, observation. So satellite, the, one of the main use is uh, for, um, yeah, uh, speaking about optical satellite can inform on accumulation at sea surface. So we, satellite, we can really go on the sea and we can have uh, uh, even daily, in certain cases, a uh, uh, view of, uh, of the sea far from the coast as well. Uh, and we can look for directly for uh, concentrations so or large accumulation of plastic uh, or, or proxies of plastic. So uh, knowing that there are accumulation, we can identify the accumulation. We have seen uh, both in the presentation of uh, Manuel Arias and uh, in the presentation of uh, Chuan Minhu uh, that we are able to identify uh, slick like sort of accumulation that goes under different name depending on the uh, dynamical formation it can be like uh, windrows or fronts and we can do that with the uh, very high resolution satellite uh, we can actually uh, help the the monitoring especially uh, both on the sea of course we can have a, an improved view uh, down to 15 20 30 centimeter spatial resolution, we can have an improved view of what the accumulation is about. But and even more, in uh, they can help on, uh, on the beach, so on the coast, uh, due to uh, the uh, more difficult, uh, uh, more complex spectral characterization that uh, the sand uh, uh, imply. Um, we have seen also uh, radar technologies with uh, LAIA today and also introduced by uh, Manuel yesterday. Uh, uh, radar based, uh, microwave based technology uh, could inform on presence of floating matter, especially in uh, uh, large accumulation and in accumulation which are enough for dampening the waves through which mechanism uh, uh, microwave uh, sensor can detect the presence of something floating on the wave. And possibly, and but these are still under uh, research uh, as, a, as, a, as a question, possibly maybe we can even uh, separate uh, the, the, the component, the material from other surfactants and other floating material via the dielectric constant study of uh, the signal received. We have seen also the possibility to have uh, thermal infrared uh, deployed for uh, detecting uh, floating plastic by thermal contracts which also allow uh, potentially the use of this technology in the night, something that with all the other optic-based 
technology unless we have an illumination source. So that means uh, speaking about uh, uh, low altitude, like drones application, we cannot have, of course, from satellites in the night. Um, we have discussed the fact that uh, uh, remote sensing have limitation, especially at the moment from uh, satellites. Uh, in general, so generally speaking, uh, um, we have uh, a limitation in terms of monitoring frequency, like it happens for satellites, and or spatial coverage, like it is the case for drones. So uh, each of the platform can have its uh, advantages, but has also its limitation. We have a limit in spatial resolution for specific uh, platform, especially for satellite, and some application need to identify specific items. So. Uh, in this sense, satellite, of course, we have a, a very big limit at the moment, even if we think about very high resolution satellites. Of course, technology will progress. That is a, a instantaneous uh, time shot. Um, there is a separation between the actual floating plastic debris and other components and phenomena is also an issue. So uh, as, as uh, we said, we can detect large accumulation uh, we can detect patches, but depending from the platform, so the altitude and the, the distance of our remote sensing, uh, uh, we, we have limits. Um, and uh, uh, um, of course, this uh, depends on the technology you're using, uh, but we know already from the presentation of uh, uh, Chuan Hu that we have limits in making this discrimination if we are using only visible bands, uh, so we need to use other bands, like from the near to the sphere, which at the moment from satellite have more limits. Um, and uh, we need so also to develop uh, instrumentation with adequate uh, spatial resolution, but also with dedicated bands with uh, suitable even uh, bandwidths. For microplastic, well, the at the moment, uh, quite low overall concentration makes uh, very difficult the use of uh, spectral method to detect the presence of microplastic in the water column. That's something still under research, uh, but we know that uh, microplastic, microplastic density at the moment uh, seems to be uh, quite low for the uh, uh, especially high altitude platform that uh, we, we can use. Uh, there is, of course, the limit between the size of the items uh, against the spatial resolution and the signal to noise ratio we, we can receive, depending on the platform. And this plays, of course, a very important role, uh, again, depending uh, on what you want to see. So if, if very small items uh, is a compromise in terms of uh, uh, spatial resolution and signal you can get, and this limits, of course, more and more uh, we uh, go up to satellites. In general, speaking about satellite remote sensing, we know that detect something on the sea is uh, can be relatively easy. Uh, the the problems and the big challenge come in discriminating this something uh, with uh, the technology we have uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, there was this example of of uh, Shuamin about uh, the fact that we can. Uh, uh, detect uh, uh, slick kind of formation. We have seen also from Manuel, uh, like Windrows and Fronts. Uh, the challenge now is to, uh, uh, so we know that these are accumulation. We have a very great mechanism to, uh, to, 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 to allow us to focus uh, in specific uh, uh, hotspots, but we have a big challenge to uh, be able to provide the reliable information on what is the exact content of that accumulation. So is there, is there um, plastic, for example? And of course, the other big limit that we have is uh, well, a limit that uh, can apply in a way in, uh, in uh, all the cases. We have uh, interference for many elements like uh, the sun glint on the sea, uh, the biofouling that forms on, uh, on the litter that can shield the useful signal. Uh, the different size, shape, color of the items we want to see. The fact that uh, in the water they are wet and that's dampen a lot the signal at uh, uh, higher frequency, uh, sorry, at higher wavelength, uh, uh, so lower frequency. So this is a very quick sum up 
draft uh, uh, excuse us the um, the style of the presentation is very textual but that's uh, what was able to produce uh, in a very very short time we are coming now to the uh, part three and um, part three is a breakout discussion so it's uh, actually more a open discussion um, we don't have a panel we want to make it uh, more uh, open so everybody want to intervene and also you from the audience uh, uh, through the Padlet or the Q&A window here in Zoom, please intervene. This is a sort of a real uh, uh, hands-on workshop where we are trying together to, uh, to discuss input that will come, I hope, uh, uh, in, uh, in real time. And actually, in the meantime, I, I also see Manuel uh, join the session. Uh, Manuel was uh, uh, busy in uh, presenting uh, um, the, uh, say, a wrap up, a summary of uh, uh, our events to the final United Nations closure events uh, with the interview from a, a journalist uh, in, the, in the general United Nations uh, framework environment. So, uh, I, hi, Manuel. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think we now we are at the moment and uh, uh, to uh, share the discussion and launch the uh, the say this informal uh, panel with the people present right now about uh, well mainly two guiding questions. So, um, Manuel, if you're happy, we can uh, we can share now this. Uh, but I'm happy also that uh, you you guide the, the discussion. If it is okay for you. Sure, sure. I can continue. And, uh, but uh, you will need to pass the slides. Well, there are only two, right? Yes. Yeah, we have yeah. only two. Yes. Yes. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you, everybody, for, for joining for this uh, breakout discussion. And uh, thank you also to Paolo for the brilliant summary that uh, he has done from the previous sessions. I think uh, you have been quite exhaustive in the key messages and the key aspects that have been discussed during the days uh, uh, yesterday and uh, during this uh, afternoon. Um, uh, uh, in this part, as uh, Paolo has already mentioned, we really want to aim to try to get some uh, useful uh, summary of activities, but also uh, we want to understand better what should be the, the path in which uh, we should follow as community uh, to help us to continue to develop uh, remote sensing as a tool for reporting uh, marine debris and especially marine plastic uh, debris, which is the main uh, interest of, of this community. So for that, we plant uh, a couple of seeding questions for uh, stirring up a bit the discussion. And the first one is uh, what users, stakeholders, needs and expectations could be aligned with the current and expected short, medium term capabilities of remote sensing? So uh, this question is meant to, to help us to make sure that the remote sensing experts, we understand the needs of the expected users of the data that we are generating. And um, in this in this sense, in this sense, we have already some nice inputs from some of our presenters. So um, uh, some of the conclusions that we got is that this is strongly uh, related to user application or platform, and in the sense that not all technologies and not all types of services have the same requirements. And a matrix of correlated user uh, and needs uh, to for the applications is something that we need to generate. So this type of matrix is very important for the remote sensing experts in order to understand uh, what uh, it is needed and what type of technology we need to use for, for each one. And as a good example uh, that was, uh, was depicted yesterday is our deport authority uh, that uh, presented uh, or, or, or they mentioned the need that they have to uh, report on a uh, presence of uh, marine debris because of it has impact and consequences in navigations. And in particular, what they want to have is an application that warns to navigation on accumulations of debris that can damage propellers. And uh, one of the examples are cost uh, nets or fishing nets and cleaning hardware areas. The need that they have is very high spatial temporal resolution, uh, and they are interested in spotting any type of marine debris, not just plastic. 
And in addition, uh, the platforms that they feel are better suited for them are drones and fixed platforms with very high resolution and multispectral sensors that actually can detect this, uh, this type of terrorists uh, and can be operated uh, directly from ports or even perhaps from the big ships. So um, uh, this is just an example of what we are trying to, to, to get out of this part of the discussion. So um, is there anybody that wants to start uh, proposing things here? Perhaps uh, we can uh, do a round table about the people that are uh, as panelists appearing here. So uh, Costas, uh, you are also running one of those uh, services. So somehow you are in the two ends of the question. You are a remote sensing expert, but you are also a service provider. So uh, in terms of uh, the service that uh, you are uh, creating uh, there in Greece that you have presented very nicely today. Uh, do you have any type of uh, feedback from uh, local authorities or from users that uh, should be taken into account when uh, you are operating and designing the service? Yes, up to now we use it uh, in Greece for a large scale uh, with a charity foundation, Las Carides Charity Foundation. They need to have a service like this because they go to uh, in the Greek coastline and they clean the beaches, so they need to have a service like this. Um, the, we know that we have a, a limit with the use of the drone, so now, now we are looking for solutions in order to cover larger area. That will be perfect if we can have a fixed wind drone and we can cover uh, kilometers of uh, coastline per day. Um, they are uh, very satisfied with uh, the service because they know where to go and where to collect uh, data sets. And uh, they can um, uh, move their uh, boats towards the specific areas in the coastline. Also, we are in discussions with the local authorities here, the municipalities. They also want to know where uh, they have uh, um, um, accumulation of plastics in the beach, and uh, this is uh, also very nice. They asked us to cover the larger area that we can for, for, for this reason. Uh, they are also very satisfied when they can see uh, that they uh, can uh, use this service in order to, to clean the coastal area. But um, also have to say that they are uh, also very happy when they, we can prove that uh, the beach is cleaned without uh, at least large accumulation of uh, plastics. So oh, and the third one is uh, potential use of uh, this service for the uh, port authorities. Um, um, there is a new law coming and the uh, port authorities want to, 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 to um, report on the presence of plastics in their area. And uh, I think that uh, this is also quite important. In terms of uh, remote sensing now, uh, everyone wants to have a service that can detect plastics on the beaches, which is uh, understandable. And um, for our next steps, we would like to uh, explore the possibility of connecting the accumulation of plastics on the beaches with the satellite uh, images. This is a question mark for us. And uh, if we are able to do this, at least with a high resolution data set, then we'll be able to analyze and uh, detect uh, plastics in a larger scale and uh, to monitor uh, large areas. Finally, I have to say that uh, the plastic leader project and the artificial targets um, are quite important for the algorithms that we try to build for, for, for the detection of accumulation of plastics in the oceans. Uh, we have seen uh, these data sets to be used from numerous uh, scientists all over the world, and I think that it's quite important to build a network of these uh, artificial targets uh, yeah, on the sea surface. It would be really nice to see other um, uh, groups and uh, uh, initiatives in order to have uh, you know, many places around the globe 
so we can have uh, enough data in order to train the algorithms and uh, be able to do uh, nice uh, to have nice results. Okay, thank you, Costas. So uh, essentially, uh, the use of satellites in this case will become a complementary tool to the drone observations. Uh, so that to provide the spatial coverage, uh, one of the bullet points that we have mentioned about the uh, potential limitations of uh, some specific technologies, uh, to uh, really uh, be able to inform, uh, let's say, at in this case, would be regional scale of the state of the plastic pollution on beaches. Um, but in, from the user's point of view, uh, the feedback that uh, we have been getting uh, during this particular the, the first day, where we get the discussion with the stakeholders. Uh, do you gather any particular aspects uh, related to uh, drone technologies that uh, you didn't think of uh, previously that uh, you might now consider for your future work and of your team? Yes, I think that um, the, um, yeah, the, the, um, specific needs from from these uh, groups that you said uh, um there's a gap between the service that we can uh, provide and uh, the need that they have so we need to uh, specify what we can do and what we cannot do and um, they need to understand what the technology can be done uh, so i have to say that um, there is a possibility of uh, you know filling this gap and um, we need to um, sit down in a table and uh, discuss their needs and uh, our uh, uh, services um, we are in a position now that uh, um, we can provide the litter uh, detection using drone data However, we cannot extend this information in large area. The, the, most of the customers, I can say customers or I can I say companies or uh, the need of the service is to cover a very large area. Uh, this is something that uh, it's not possible to be done right now. Uh, we are working on this. And um, I think that um, with the uh, technology that exists and uh, with the uh, knowledge that we have in a few years, this could be uh, something that is possible. Very good. Uh, thanks, Costas. And you have mentioned some, some gaps. Uh, what, what are, uh, I know that maybe you will not uh, recall everything right now, but, but uh, what are the main gaps uh, that uh, you have seen uh, between uh, user expectations and uh, technical possibilities. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, to be to be honest, um, the need is to have to see all the plastics from let's say microplastics in a huge area. So right now we cannot uh, do that. We can see mega plastics, let's say plastics that uh, at least for us are uh, more than a few centimeters. Uh, and we can see it with the use of artificial intelligence. We have some problems on detection. Would like to have uh, wavelengths and spectral uh, data sets that uh, they are ideal for the detection of the plastics. This, uh, let's say, cameras uh, does not uh, exist right now. We saw a very nice presentation from Els from Vito. And um, also, we know that uh, we need to expand this in a larger area. So we would like to have um, a, a, a sensor that can distinguish the plastics or the litter in general from other uh, materials. This also is um, not ready. So this, the, let's say that the technology cannot cover the needs of the market right now. Uh, however, we're working on this. I mean, also, I believe that the last five years is uh, tremendous. The work that we have done, I mean, as a community, we have increased our knowledge uh, really uh, in a high level. And I think that um, if we continue like this, we will be able to deliver something uh, meaningful, meaningful in the following years. So the gaps actually are 
on the way that we use the technology right now. Yeah, that's a very, very nice answer. And uh, I would like to jump now to other of the speakers. And uh, as we have mentioned, microplastics, which uh, it is true, uh, there has been a substantial uh, mention, in, especially in the part two, uh, to this type of uh, applications. And uh, we have even seen a, a talk from Xiaoming Hu, in which uh, he was essentially reporting that uh, with optical data, uh, we could not uh, easily detect uh, the actual concentrations of microplastics in, in our open waters. And uh, then I want to, to, to raise this question to, to Victor Martinez in first place. So, uh, Victor, and um, under your experience in terms of uh, what is the, the use of optical data, what's your view in terms of the, of the potential uh, evolution of remote sensing techniques for uh, microplastics uh, quantification or detection. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the question, Manuel. Uh, well, <clears throat> the, uh, the problem of detection of, uh, of microplastics, uh, it's on, the, not on, the, on their abundance. Uh, as uh, was highlighted yesterday, and the, the, the problem of uh, signal to noise ratio uh, is there. It's um, uh, the data we are collecting now mostly on microplastics are for uh, uh, millimeters uh, or very small millimeter, like uh, uh, half a, a, a millimeter uh, size of, of plastic. And uh, we know already from optical remote sensing that. Uh, the, the strongest uh, signals in ocean color come from particles that are smaller than that because uh, they have a, a much more uh, efficient way of backscattering the light. Uh, and also because they're, uh, they are uh, much more in, in numbers. So at the moment, uh, they, they, the measurements that we have uh, from ocean color and anything that we can perhaps uh, develop uh, in the future will be uh, will be uh, challenging will be uh, uh, if not impossible uh, so uh, we have two alternatives in this scenario one is to despair and to think uh, there is no solution to this uh, the other one is to uh, try to address the challenge in a different way uh, or three actually or the other one is to abandon totally uh, uh, and uh, and think okay well this is nothing uh, we can do about this we can do uh, uh, something else i uh, uh, cultivate my my land so uh, but if we don't surrender and we think uh, well we can try to find some alternative to this uh, i think i have uh, uh, at least uh, two options and it's all indirect uh, method so uh, the first one is to try to uh, identify uh, the uh, optically active substances that uh, correlate uh, with uh, microplastic uh, concentrations and this uh, might be uh, a bit uh, difficult to find and maybe a, a very uh, changeable relationships between uh, say uh, total suspended matter uh, and uh, microplastic uh, concentrations. There have been studies already and uh, they prove that this, uh, uh, this correlation, it's uh, uh, sometimes is not very robust in, in rivers, but uh, it is also very variable. Uh, so uh, it's one of the avenues we are looking into it. The other avenue also indirect, it's uh, to try to find the uh, proxies. Proxies uh, 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 through uh, the combination of different uh, ways of uh, looking at the ocean. We have already a huge constellation of satellites and uh, looking at the ocean from different points of view with different sensor techniques. Uh, so each of these uh, sensors are giving us a part of, of information, like a puzzle. If we put them together and connect the pieces of the puzzle, we may get uh, some indications of risk areas where accumulation of microplastics uh, may be occurring. So uh, this is, again, not a quantification, not a direct detection, but it's just a, a, an alternative way to resolve this. Then, uh, of course, there are uh, 
or they're looking forward further away in the future, uh, there might be uh, some uh, some um, uh, novel techniques, uh, and we are looking into those uh, in the IOCCG uh, task uh, force for marine litter uh, detection in the core topic one, which is about technologies, and uh, we're looking at. Uh, uh, techniques such as uh, uh, LiDAR uh, and uh, uh, other ones like um, polarization. But I am not an expert on those, so don't ask me uh, to give you any details on those. <laughs> uh, I hope this uh, addresses the, the question. Sure, and uh, opens also an invitation for uh, Shungu Garawa to tell us about uh, polarimetric techniques. So Shungu, are you with us? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, do you yes. do you uh, can you please develop in what uh, you think could be uh, the contribution of uh, polarimetric techniques to 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 address uh, the needs of uh, users and stakeholders in the remote sensing of uh, plastic debris? All right. Uh, thank you, Mano, and thank you for the audience for sticking with us until yeah Friday. Uh, it's almost six o'clock. Um, yeah. Uh, so the topic of polar polarimetric studies or polarization, it's still, you know, like we are still doing groundwork on that. So, you know, like polarization has been used over the years to study stress in plastics, but now we're trying to further explore, you know, like try to further investigate if, if we have like with the current technologies and probably like future technologies, if we are going to include polarimetric observations, would they add value or rather like should we consider just using polarization as one of the tools, but as expressed before, like with the other like speakers before me, we are, we are using remote sensing as a complementary tool and within the different technologies, we are trying to find complementarity. So, to answer your question related to polar, polarization or polarimetric observations, of course, there is some promising results, um, but I would say, well, my final statement would be stay tuned. Very soon there'll be like publications related to that. Uh, let me not be a spoiler to what's coming. <laughs> Very good replies, and we will for sure be tuned to your uh, scientific publications and of your team to, to, to check on this. And uh, picking up on also one of the comments from, from Victor, in which uh, he has mentioned the possibility of combined technologies, uh, I want now to, to make a question to Laia Romero on this side. Uh, Laia, so yes. uh, in your uh, work, uh, you have been uh, trying to use uh, the detections of uh, floating debris uh, using optical data uh, to train actually uh, machine learning algorithms that are able later on to exploit uh, synthetic aperture radar data to try to, to, to do detections. So how do you think this type of approaches could uh, help to fulfill the, 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 the needs of the users and stakeholders? I think that, uh, well, from my experience and then seeing other, like some of the presentations, I always get the feeling that maybe when I speak, I don't, I don't sound too optimistic. And then I feel that in reality, the results that we get are to be very optimistic in the sense that, um, that we are demonstrating that we can detect marine litter and that it can be a combined, a combined effort by using, as you were saying, optical data with SAR data um, in this case. And it is the only, I see it like the only way to go, like from my perspective, um, trying to tackle uh, and like targets on the ocean with only optical data is, you, you are, a, way more expert than I am in optical data, but uh, it's really, really challenging. I think that a combined approach makes all the sense. Also on the topic of the microplastics, if we are looking at, um, at roughness, we should be able to, 
to address different densities on the on the like from the water surface it's not like theory theoretically it's not a, an impossible approach of course the signal to noise ratio is also a very big problem for the SAR signal but um, I would not abandon like Victor was suggesting in one of the options I, I think we should really go into the lab and and make measurements on a, like experimental measurements on on controlled experiments with different bands with different um, types of materials and in different conditions of wind uh, especially yes indeed uh, actually uh, one of the limitations that are known for optical data is specifically the, the cloud uh, coverage which as, as we all know it uh, makes impossible to use uh, optical data from satellites to to retrieve uh, information from the surface um, so obviously uh, using uh, active uh, methods like uh, synthetic aperture radar are quite good to to cover or to fill this this, this mm. gap this space uh, that uh, optical data is, is is provided and uh, thanks a lot for that mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just a reminder to everybody and uh, it is not just us the panelists who, who may contribute so if anybody from the audience uh, wants to give uh, his or her two cents, uh, please uh, feel free to, to let us know. And um, uh, now, from my point of view, also, uh, I have been working more in the, in the particularly in the last uh, two years, in the use of uh, uh, proxies for 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 marine digital detection. And uh, one of the the, the aspects that uh, has come to, to us which could be interesting is precisely the something that uh, Victor has mentioned is the possibility to uh, not just focus in direct detection of uh, marine plastic litter or marine debris but also in trying to uh, use uh, proxies or other elements that are much easier to, uh, to, to, uh, to detect the satellite but that they can inform about the uh, presence of, uh, of, of marine plastic. The, the advantage of this is that if you have a good model able to link uh, these uh, proxies with actual uh, presence of uh, marine debris or marine plastic litter, you, you, you can have a solution for, for reporting in this type of contamination. On the other hand, uh, by, because of we are using proxies, we are not uh, quantifying uh, with enough accuracy, uh, probably, uh, the, the, the quantities uh, that are required by by the end users and by the stakeholders. So it's something to to pick it up and uh, probably is one of the ways forward uh, as a first order approach. But uh, probably for the future, we will have also to uh, to to dive more into uh, detection techniques. So one of the aspects that has been side mentioned, uh, well, and directly mentioned also during the, the session this morning. Is that uh, and yesterday is that the the, the, the detection of uh, floating uh, marine plastic and floating marine debris uh, at the ocean with optical data? Uh, it is also a problem of uh, spectral mix mixing, uh, which uh, within the pixel that makes uh, much harder the, the detection. So, so I mean, who yesterday was talking about. Uh, the contrast of uh, spectral bands uh, between the water and the target that you have. But uh, on top of that, we should that uh, the mixing that we often have when litter is present is not just water and plastic. Uh, we have water, plastic, quite often we have seaweeds and even dead wood. And uh, this is one of the reasons why the, the type of uh, experiments that uh, are being done by COSTAS with artificial targets and testing different types of floating materials is very important for us because we need really to understand uh, the, the different contributions, uh, spectrally speaking, uh, that uh, the different compounds uh, of substances in each of the pixels uh, will have. Um, uh, moving forward, I think, uh, Paolo, we can try to jump to the next uh, next slide. So the, the second uh, point uh, or question that we wanted to, to address in this breakout discussion is, which are the next steps to advance and match tech capabilities and expectations? 
based guidelines, possibly under a mandate of the UN Decadal Action in the frame of the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So uh, the, the purpose of this is really is to help as a remote sensing of a marine litter, plastic and marine debris as a whole community in order to improve uh, our level of coordination and also to address uh, what are our common needs in a way to make more strength uh, in the decision making process and get uh, farther the support. One of the ideas of the OCEAN Decades uh, objectives is precisely to reinforce uh, global initiatives that are able to make a difference and to the, the, that they embrace people from different uh, branches and they can address specific uh, targets for, for each of those uh, OCEAN Decade objectives. Those are called Decadal Actions and, uh, uh, and those decadal actions have some expected outcomes from the point of view of the United Nations. So, for instance, in the context of the uh, plastic, uh, marine plastic debris, there is a very specific uh, final objective which is able to uh, define um, a, a clear uh, marine uh, plastic debris index which can be used by decision making uh, organizations uh, politicians and governments to check uh, in first place what are the main uh, areas impacted by by the problem in second thing in second stage to uh, put in place uh, mitigation methodologies and in third step uh, to check what it is the impact of those uh, mitigation uh, measurements into the plastic pollution and for that they really request for a particular or a specific uh, marine debris index that can be a uh, de device by combining remote sensing with of course in situ observations citizen science etc so initiatives uh, like uh, the one that we have seen uh, presented by laia like ocean scan it, they help to gather this data together which eventually needs to be a uh, process and tackle to really uh, build up a, a simple, easy to understand information that uh, can help into the governance of this problem. So during the event, we have a few a few inputs in this in this line already, and uh, requests from from the different presenters and uh, the right also from the participation from the community. The first one is uh, having expert groups to provide synthesis of a state of the art for technologies, algorithms, data sets, interdisciplinary aspects, as we are already doing in the IOCC task force, and to identify tech gaps where to put fu uh, funding for tech push and filling knowledge gaps. So this is one of the, uh, the, the, the next steps that uh, we see as community are, are required. And the second one is uh, use monitoring platforms and technologies in synergy we have already discussed it uh, just right now about that, and promote applications which are already implementable with drones and planes, for example, and to boost the ground truth collections to be shared as much as possible via interoperable open access databases. This, this point yesterday was on even a specific question uh, that was raising why it's so difficult to, to, uh, to, to get uh, open access to, to data sets. And uh, we must say that uh, at least at the IOCC task force, uh, there is a core topic led by Shungu that precisely is trying to, to, to help on this. And actually, he already presented about this, uh, about this, this point. The, the third uh, element is to coordinate internationally outside of the remote sensing area. And uh, one of the main uh, aspects in which uh, the remote sensing community can, can work with other uh, communities that are interested in marine litter is through the uh, integrated marine debris observatory system framework. Uh, this indoors uh, concept was endorsed by a substantial number of researchers from different domains uh, uh, during uh, the Ocean Ops 2019, and there was even a white paper presented by the community. And obviously, this is a quite ambitious. Uh, difficult target to obtain, but nevertheless, it's still the, the global objective that, uh, that uh, we are setting up the global community for, for, the, for developing their uh, monitoring tools. And um, uh, this is one of the things that is being also requested, is more coordination. 
And uh, the next bullet point is uh, data for development and validation is missing, as well as supporting training of artificial intelligence techniques. Initiatives like Ocean Scan Database and the Manager Project for ground truth are very important for this effort. So it is well known that uh, for developing uh, retrieval methodologies using remote sensing techniques, you need uh, to have also ground truth data. Uh, this ground truth data is used both for development and validation. And this ground truth data, it is not just needed for, for remote sensing, eventually it's also needed for models uh, that, uh, that they will use also data from remote sensing. So at the end, uh, not getting enough ground truth information is one of the main limitations we have in development. Uh, actually, uh, Caleb presented the event today that uh, despite of that they are also working uh, very successfully in detections of lands in places, uh, they still need to uh, develop a significant training data sets uh, for uh, having artificial intelligence solutions to operate in other areas of the globe, be beyond the areas that they have been working so far. Um, this just highlights the, the difficulty we are facing, but uh, uh, in a number of initiatives that have been run already by the Open Space Agency, it has been also an issue. And the, 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 the next bullet point is that artificial intelligence, I just mentioned it, is considered an emerging tool that the community is using more and more, and that it is likely to be a keystone of the remote sensing of marine heater. So this uh, is an important point. Uh, many other presentations we have seen the last uh, two days uh, have a certain level of integration of artificial intelligence technologies. And, um, and it looks like the community is pushing towards this integration farther and farther because it seems to be very well suited for uh, for the marine debris uh, uh, detection and for the plastic detection. And uh, perhaps one of the objectives that we could have as community is to increase the literacy of remote sensing experts in artificial intelligence, which could be one way, one tool to uh, push uh, further into this uh, particular objective. And the last bullet point is obviously more funding for an agency for remote sensing, obviously, and uh, this is kind of a given uh, requirement, but uh, we must say that uh, remote sensing, even if uh, we are having already uh, for five years around, that is a very short period of time in terms of research and development. And actually, uh, it is amazing, as Costa has mentioned already, that in only five years, there are already uh, quite promising uh, techniques and solutions. Uh, probably the progress in some particular platforms like drones have, have evolved much faster, uh, but uh, there is a still a good way uh, still in front of us to actually be able to uh, provide global maps based in, in remote sensing data. Uh, so far, those are the, the main aspects uh, that we have uh, condensated from these days. Um, that the committee has reported to, to us in terms of the next steps. But now I want to jump to, to uh, our speakers again to see uh, whether they have uh, additional contributions to, to this list. So uh, perhaps uh, we can start um, this time with uh, Victor to change the order a bit. Victor, you want to give you two cents on this? Or three? My, or my half penny. Yes, uh, they. Uh, I am. Uh, yeah, I, I think these are uh, are very important uh, uh, topics. Uh, uh, this morning there was another parallel uh, satellite activity, which was the Indos uh, uh, one. Um, my uh, my idea my idea is that uh, our first that the remote sensing part will contribute to the Indos uh, submission to a um, to a. Uh, uh, ocean Decade uh, program as an, as a as a but the structure as an as a as a project or 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 a very very self contained uh, uh, and very uh, we're we're very we're already very uh, very well organized uh, through the uh, IOCCG task force uh, uh, on on their side I, I I hope that some of the people that uh, was this morning in the session from Indos will be here and it will be very nice to hear from them. Uh, I think uh, on the next steps uh, uh, to move uh, towards this, uh, there will be, 
we will hopefully be using uh, the notes from the meeting and uh, perhaps this uh, the list of participants uh, to this satellite event to uh, to uh, contact uh, and uh, probably get uh, some information about that. But uh, we have already a, a core group uh, of people who will be uh, working on this uh, on the basis of the IOCCG task force. Uh, uh, other than this is uh, another aspect of this is uh, the possibility of linking with uh, biodiversity uh, observation and next week there will be a workshop on bio biodiversity uh, 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 observation of uh, floating uh, algae and some of the participants in this satellite activity will be also there uh, and it uh, it has been uh, uh, recognize that there is quite a lot of overlap, uh, uh, especially in uh, in observation requirements. So this this uh, should be uh, further discussed and um, and optimized. So that we don't do uh, we can do just uh, one observing system that maybe uh, could uh, fulfill uh, various sets of observations. I don't know, but uh, or at least uh, one of uh, uh, looking at it from the remote sensing. Uh, 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 part. Uh, that's it. Very nice, Victor. So, uh, if I understood well, particularly from your your last uh, comment on this, uh, what you mean is that uh, increasing the interdisciplinarity of uh, the of the remote sensing community that uh, works in my leader by introducing some other communities that maybe are not exactly interested in the same topic, but uh, they may have similar requirements, uh, it could be a, a good idea, right? I think it is an idea to be explored. Uh, is so that we don't duplicate uh, the effort mm. in different groups, and then you have to move from one group to another to see what the other people are doing. And uh, I think uh, we should be perhaps thinking a bit wider uh, uh, for the work we do and, uh, and try to integrate uh, more aims. Uh, I, I see, uh, for instance, when you develop a, a satellite mission, uh, you have uh, several um, aims uh, to measure. So, uh, and, and in the end, you, you develop one satellite that it's able to fulfill several uh, types of requirements. Uh, uh, you, you, for instance, you have Sentinel-2, who was originally designed for land uh, observation, but then there is some of the wavelengths that are perhaps more for water, and uh, and uh, the marine and aquatic community can take advantage of those. So uh, it is that kind of uh, integration, so we can all uh, benefit from the same sort of effort and, and all push together towards a, a, an aim. Uh, whatever it may be. But I think uh, there are some commonalities and uh, uh, we're exploring them now. Yes, uh, and that is a very good comment uh, because of uh, actually, uh, particularly for, for, for the satellite component, uh, we know that uh, we don't have a, a output post made sensor flying on the space that is really meant to, to, to measure plastic pollution. So one could imagine that uh, we could uh, define or design uh, a specific uh, sensors or platforms able to uh, be more efficient than the, than the current technologies, which may uh, resolve some of, uh, of our existing issues for, for the remote sensing. So in this context, uh, do you have any particular recommendation of what you think uh, technology should, should evolve towards to, to improve our uh, potential capabilities for detecting marine plastic debris? Oof, if I had uh, one straight away from the top of my head, uh, I wouldn't be here. I'd be constructing uh, <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a satellite uh, <laughs> uh, myself or, or, or putting that proposal uh, uh, on the table to, to ISA. But uh, no, at the moment, uh, I think we're doing what we should be doing. It's uh, pushing the technologies that we have uh, currently, realizing, learning, what it's currently possible with what we have and what it is not, uh, uh, and defining uh, perhaps the next steps uh, with uh, more uh, integration of, of other uh, of different uh, data sources. 
and uh, perhaps uh, looking at the same technologies, but at different uh, uh, scales of observation. Things like uh, hubs, we haven't yet uh, uh, high altitude uh, platforms, uh, we haven't uh, evaluated yet, uh, and we don't know what is their potential. So, uh, um, so I think uh, there are uh, avenues at the moment, but uh, I don't have uh, the uh, perfect uh, response, and I don't have uh, uh, an agenda that uh, I got. So uh, I would like to share it with you if I had one straight away. But I think uh, it is important to listen to requirements and to connect uh, to the communities because uh, several brains uh, connecting together and being open. Uh, are uh, much more efficient than one perhaps limited brain like mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Victor. And uh, now uh, jumping with the same uh, question or next steps, uh, Laya, do you have any uh, recommendations in terms of uh, what uh, we should be doing as community or from the technological point of view? Uh, to further develop uh, capabilities to use remote sensing for marine plastic litter. Are you asking me? Did you say Laia? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was yes. not sure. Uh, thank you, Manuel. I think that what you mentioned about the need for data, well, I really appreciate it, but it's very much on point. When everything that we are developing on AI needs for this ground truth. And, and the same thing with the lab experiments. Like we, we are at a point where in very little time, we advanced a lot in what we know of the technologies. We have a much better criteria uh, because we have already compared a lot of things and, and, and analyzed a lot of things. But the effort on getting this data to build a very solid ground, so to say, in order to further develop these knowledge and technologies is a first uh, need from my perspective. And, and we should look into what drones can do, what planes can do. I think that having this standardized repository of data that is accessible will greatly help. And yeah, and, and funding is necessary because many of us, we are spending, we're putting a lot of effort into these initiatives because we are passionate about what we do. But there is a moment where we need, um, I think, some sort of investment from, from institutions or from, I don't know, to go into deeper into the studies that we are doing. And yeah, I think data, yeah, access to data, sharing the data and a way of collecting data in a way that is very much aligned with what is needed by the remote sensing community. And the combination of, this, of the sensors, not only satellites, but platforms, the drones, the planes. Um, there are many people that are being able to see plastic patches on land and on the ocean and on rivers and we should bring all of those efforts together very nice answer Elia. thank you very much and from respect to uh, to you also Elia, uh, respect to the technological push uh, because you come more from the active uh, sensing community uh, do you think is should there should be any particular uh, technological push or uh, or, or perspective uh, for uh, further improving uh, the technology and to help the uh, marine litter, marine plastic litter detection. What what is a technology push? In what way? Because yes, to so me, for technology instance, push sounds bad. It's <laughs> what no. Uh, it means, for instance, if uh, you are thinking that uh, you are using synthetic particle So, for instance, uh, you you think. A spatial resolution from SAR is enough, we will need uh, to improve it. Is the sign and to noise ratio sufficient or we should improve uh, somehow uh, our uh, uh, the, 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 the sensitivity of uh, our instruments? 
Of course, we, yes. the thing is like, of course, we should improve it. And it's not only improve it. It is an analysis and it is a compromise. Because if you are able to capture certain things in your signal, you will be, I mean, there. it is a compromise. You will lose a lot of things. Like what you gain in resolution, you will uh, lose it um, on, on the sensitivity It's or the cost is also an issue. Like it is the, the system design overall that we should be looking into. But to get to that point, we still have many things to answer. And I guess that the same applies for other technologies. So without um, this information and these analysis and these experiments, it is difficult to imagine how a future mission should be, like if we had to like write it down. <laughs> um, but what I know, it is worth the money or the effort that is put into because the need for this to be working by society is really high. So I think that we should move forward and think that the benefit of, of this knowledge that is being created is great for, for communities, for all of us as humans in the planet. So we should, I like very much this idea in which we are trying to highlight the importance of the work that we are developing from a very societal perspective. So what will this, uh, because if it is a mission that will solve such uh, great problems, okay, then we should take it into account very seriously <laughs> and put uh, and do this technology push that I think that is what you're suggesting, no? In a positive way, so to say, to, to, to invest more on the technology, I guess. Okay, great, uh, great answer, Laya. Actually, it is true. There is a uh, paradox in terms that uh, for uh, identifying uh, more suitable uh, technologies, or, or let's say to make the technologies to evolve, first we need to identify the most optimal uh, detection principles, uh, which is essentially uh, where most part of the community of remote sensing is uh, still working, particularly in the satellite side of the things, uh, to try to uh, produce some, some, some initial algorithms, initial detection principles that obviously uh, they are being done with existing data sets and technologies, but that uh, they could pro prove to be the seed of identifying what are the current limitations so that we can uh, feed that back to the, uh, the engineering and technology component of remote sensing to try to address these, these particular problems. But getting back to, to, to these uh, next steps, I, I would like now to know from, from Shungu Garaba. Uh, Shungu, what are your views in terms of, um, of uh, the next steps uh, that we should do as as community, as a group working in this topic? Do you have any recommendation for this, for this group? Shungu? I think uh, Sungu is not with us. So I put the same question to, to Costas. So Costas. Uh, I'm here, no, sorry. My ah, speaker okay, is, okay. It just died, it just died on me, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, so Sungu, please. Uh, what was the question again? Sorry about that. No, uh, uh, what was your recommendation in terms of next steps that you want to uh, send uh, or share with uh, with the remote sensing community and that we could frame to the United Nations? Oh, so that's a very good question. And I think, yeah, the starting point is we have done as like, you know, toddler steps. We have done a toddler step by forming, you know, like a united front with the IOCCG task force. And, you know, like the next step is we have several projects which are running like re scientific evidence based activities that are being conducted across the world, like in Europe and also in the USA. And um, I think the next step is to motivate the other, well, other entities or uh, scientific, scientific community to build upon some of the findings we have already. 
so that we can quickly advance the field and then try to come up with uh, suitable ways. So we have seen some presentations today showing already like the use of current tools and then try to move, you know, like if we are going to build a sensor, like uh, Victor was saying, uh, if we're going to build a sensor, it should be based on robust, you know, studies and calibration and validation. And we already have information that also makes the sensor useful to other communities, you know, interdisciplinary applications. And the, of course, like the main message I'll repeat again, it's like making things open access. We have to make things open access. And yeah, I think that's the main message. Uh, you're muted, Mano. Thank you, Sungo. And uh, indeed, it's a uh, quite uh, often asked question is uh, what about the data? But the problem is not just limited to data. And uh, yesterday, there was even who suggested to have a repository of uh, retrieval algorithms that can be available to the community. So there are a lot of people uh, that are really looking for this type of algorithms because they are eager eager to use them. And obviously, there is uh, this uh, particular problem that we can mention about the uh, maturity of the different algorithms, which is one of the possibly one of the main reasons why uh, uh, there is still some reluctancy uh, from the community to, to share this type of uh, this type of things. But uh, one could imagine in the future uh, to have uh, particular platforms or even uh, set of toolboxes where uh, users can uh, interface with ground truth data and satellite data at the same time that they are trying to run or test uh, existing or new algorithms uh, for, for, for this. And uh, moving uh, further into the, into the discussion, we have now with us uh, Shami Hu, which uh, was one of our uh, panelists yesterday. And uh, Shamin, just for, for your uh, awareness, we are right now discussing uh, what will be the next steps uh, to advance and match the capabilities and expectations uh, within the area, of course, of, of remote sensing that uh, we would like as a group to convey to, to the global community and in particular to the United Nations within the, the, the ocean decade and the decade actions frame. So, I have a question for you is, what are, from your point of view, uh, considering the current state uh, of the things in terms of uh, remote sensing, what should be uh, your recommendation uh, about uh, what we should do next? So do you, you have any suggestion, any recommendation to do? Well, thank you, Manu, for the opportunity to speak up. Um, sorry, I missed the first part of this. I just finished my class, um, so I jumped in the, the session. What, what you have on the screen is, is great. Um, I think that these are the necessary steps. In my point of view, um, the algorithm part okay, is not mature. And uh, especially from a user perspective, uh, there is no mature algorithm to give you, say, mm -hmm. oh, I have an input of a set of data. I have an output of a debris like uh, or look like you know, image. Um, I don't think there's such a capacity yet. Um, so that's the, the, the one way to improve. Um, what I think uh, the, the, you know, the, the critical requirements now are you know, actually part of this screen uh, printout. The data, okay, where are the ground truth data? And where are the, the spectral library, you know, whatever you know, data you call it. You mentioned a, a data repository. Uh, I think uh, Shangu mentioned IOCCG has a, an archive of metadata to at least to tell the user where to find those data. It's not in one place, but uh, you know, the capacity is, is there. And I, I perhaps I, you know, I, I don't think having all the data in one place is necessary as long as you know, a user knows where to find the data, get the data, and you know, that, that should be sufficient. But in my point, the data, ground truth data, spectral data. 
And uh, we, we don't have a lot of data to play with. I know, you know, there are a lot of efforts to archive data. I think that that's, that's a good start. I heard some presentations you know, for data archive. You know, that, that's a great effort. Um, the, so number two on this, on this slide, emphasize this. I wholeheartedly agree with this. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Shamin. Uh, but uh, another another question uh, for you. Um, this is a bit uh, perhaps more difficult, but uh, if we had to do some technological development to, to improve uh, the detection of uh, marine uh, debris or marine plastic uh, litter, um, the, what aspects of the technology you think we need to, to improve or to evolve to, let's say, uh, have in the future the optimal sensor or the optimal retrieval algorithm for, for, for detecting marine plastic litter from, from space, for example? Well, I'm a person, I'm an ocean color person. I, can, I only talk about optics. You know, there are other sensors. So from the, the perspective of optics, um, I think a spatial resolution is more important than spectral resolution. So if I have the same cost, I'm restricted by cost, I would rather have a, a sensor of just a few meter resolution than having 50 spectral bands. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, the, the, the small targets. Um, also for you know, technology development, we really want to differentiate the different floating materials. So as long as we have enough bands you know, to detect all those spectral signatures, there are some narrow band spectral wiggling. If we have enough bands to that, that that's it. And for plastics, we do need more, more uh, swirl bands to pinpoint the, the plastics. And currently there are several sensors with uh, two swirl bands or three swirl bands. Those are not enough. Uh, we, we need more swirl bands. So that's for the techniques. For the algorithm, I really want to suggest, you know, when we want to perform or test the algorithm, um, we want to put more spectral end members. I mean, if you have an either or situation, that's very easy, right? Either marine debris or water, that, that's very easy. But you have different types. So let's you know, challenge ourselves as algorithm developers. So in a natural environment, suppose you know nothing about the region. You perhaps have uh, you know, floating sea grid, you have uh, plastics, you have non-plastics, you have uh, you know, the, the solid objects. Um, so can we do a better job than right now to at least to differentiate different classes? Um, that's what I see as a major challenge. Um, of course, that's related to data availability. Even if you say, you know, I have five classes classified. How do you trust it? Where is the ground truth that, that's related to this data? So they, they really tangle with each other. Uh, but as the group, you know, we have several different groups. We can each, you know, well, it's not just within the group, the entire community, I see a lot of attendees. Uh, we can each work on those different directions you know, to make a contribution. Uh, but from my point of view, it's really the confusion matrix that, that is the, the, the challenge right now. Thanks for the showing uh, And uh, we have also uh, an important point that uh, was also mentioned uh, yesterday related to the, um, uh, to the importance of uh, the effective spatial resolution of sensors respect to size of the targets, right? So uh, sensitivity to a particular uh, material floating in the surface will be related not only to the sign and the ratio of the sensor, but also to the uh, apparent size that it has for how much it contributes within within the pixels. 
So uh, current uh, public, no commercial uh, spectral satellites are uh, having, uh, and probably Sentinel-2 is one of the best in this sense, uh, they have some bands in 10 meters spatial resolution, but others uh, like uh, Landsat 8, uh, they are more in the 20. So nevertheless, we are, one could say that uh, we put together the two sensors and the different resolutions or different bands, we are in an effective resolution of 20 meters. Uh, does any of the panelists uh, that work more in, in, in the sense of, uh, of optical data uh, feeling that uh, 20 meters is enough to, to report in marine plastic pollution or we should uh, try to aim for a better spatial resolution for, for this purpose? Anybody wants to, to, to jump into this question? I can go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be honest, right now with a 10 meter resolution of 7L2, we're already facing uh, significant problems to do the detection. As uh, Sean Ning said before, we need, uh, in my point of view, much better resolution in order to be able to say uh, with some confidence that we can distinguish the plastic accumulation from the other floating material. So um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, the use of uh, 20 meters. I think that we should go a bit, uh, uh, we should aim at least in a bit more uh, uh, spatial resolution. And uh, we should also aim to focus on, on wave bands that, uh, that are quite important uh, for us. So um, uh, it's a trade-off between the spatial resolution that we would like to have and the spectral resolution that we uh, would like to have. It is, these two things have to go together. So um, um, I think that we should be pressed a lot in order to, to, to have sensors that are working with better resolution uh, in the coastlines and also to focus on wave bands that are important for us. Uh, and also I would like to comment on your previous uh, question of what we have to do. I think it's very important what we're really doing right now to interconnect between us, uh, exchange ideas and knowledge. This is the very, very important in, in, in all cases. Also, it is very important uh, to have the data sets. Uh, all the previous uh, speakers uh, spoke about this. Um, we have developed a community, community which is uh, devoted in, in this subject. This is already a very good uh, step forward. And um, I think that will be also very uh, important for, for the future to have at least uh, a few successful cases of the detection uh, of the marine litter. Once we have, uh, you know, a few of them, one, two, uh, will be really nice and we'll have the proof of the concept that uh, this can work. So we can uh, go further and, and press even more. Thank you, Costas. Any, any other view in this uh, particular question? Oh, can, can I chime in again? Sure, um, sure, sure. So the, the, the resolution requirement depends on the size of the object. Um, so the, in terms of a percentage of a pixel size, okay, is only a function of signal to noise. Um, so for um, Sentinel-2, with the current signal to noise, the detection limit is 1% of a 10 meter pixel size. 1% uh, of a 10 meter, so that's one meter square. Um, so that means if you aggregate all the scattered material within a pixel, if it's more than one meter square, it's detectable, <laughs> right? So for the same signal to noise, if we have a better resolution, like uh, with a world view, with a, Dough, 
you know, can de de detect a smaller thing. But the problem is with those high resolution sensors, you don't have enough spectral bands. That's all, quite often you have three bands and four bands. Um, but recently, uh, the planet scope has this a super dope. You know, I have just you know, look at the spectra. I haven't really played with the data. The super dove uh, constellation has eight spectral bands at a three meter resolution. Um, because it's a constellation, it for certain regions, coastal regions, it provides a daily revisit or even every every two days, you can have an image. Um, so unlike the the digital globe world view. Or if you're lucky, you may have an image, you know, for, for that year, right? So for the moving target of uh, marine debris or plastic or marine litter, you know, the high resolution and high revisited frequency, those are the key. And uh, this is a super, this is a commercial sensor, unfortunately. Uh, they may have some data policy, but uh, I see currently that's perhaps the, the most appropriate sensor for this exact purpose, you know, for the marine litter monitoring. It, it, it does not cover open ocean. Okay? It, it's most coastal region and the land, but the capacity is there. Uh, it's eight bands, the near infrared, uh, for red edge reflectance, and also 670 nanometer for the pigment absorption. So at least we can differentiate between vegetation and non-vegetation. Then look at the spectral shape, we may tell further you know, if it's non vegetation, what type of non vegetation. Um, so the, the, the capacity is there. Uh, and uh, of course, if uh, the money is enough, um, if the, the you know, ESA, ESA or NASA is, wants to, we can derive, uh, develop our own satellite, small satellite, you know, with the spectral bands more suitable than the existing sensors for marine litter. We, we know the band requirements. We know the carbon hydrate absorption locations, right? So if we just place six, eight bands in those absorption locations, we can quantify the, the reflectance trial, the depths of the reflectance trial. And the people have been using average and this principle to quantify oil slip thickness. Now that's a carbon hydrogen band bound absorption. It's the same principle. Um, but if we don't we don't need we don't need uh, 300 bands. You know, for the those you know, absorption features, if we have several neighboring bands and the peak bands, you know, we have a lot of tricks to play with. Yes, thank you, uh, Shomin. Uh, actually, uh, I I agree uh, with you uh, because of actually the the work that uh, we did for for Smiley, which uh, basically has an overarching goal to try to do recommendations for for a future mission. Uh, we came with the same type of conclusion that uh, we didn't have to go for a hyperspectral like uh, mission to operate in optics to to do a a good uh, retrieval, but uh, we needed more uh, bands that being provided by a multi-spectral mission. So somehow we are falling in the middle uh, between the two types of uh, technologies or, or types of sensors um, in terms of requirements. Uh, we need narrow bands to do an accurate uh, specification and discrimination, but uh, and we have some larger number of bands that the usual multi-spectral sensor but not necessarily uh, hundreds of bands has been provided by other types of hyperspectral sensors like Prisma. And um, I think uh, we have done a very nice uh, round table right now. Is there anybody uh, wants to throw up on the table anything else, uh, any other comment or recommendation for the next steps right now? Manuel? I yes. I have my uh, hand raised. I was just wanting to comment on uh, on the requirements that uh, Chan Min sure. was raising, and uh, and something that we were discussing before he joined in about uh, the potential for for connecting or expanding uh, 
the, the requirements uh, of marine litter to, uh, to connect with those of, uh, of some aspects, at least of, of biodiversity. I know uh, from reading uh, wor work in that community of biodiversity that uh, uh, they are faced, uh, especially in the coastal areas, with uh, requirements of uh, uh, higher revisit times, uh, so more frequent observations, uh, uh, finer spatial resolutions. They they also want uh, a higher spectral resolution, but we we, we may not need that. So uh, and they're thinking about, uh, or at least uh, one of the works I was looking at uh, was uh, discussing ideas of uh, of constellations. So um, uh, and I wanted to to uh, to ask uh, Chuan Min if uh, uh, what does he what do you think about uh, um, uh, Try to to widen the the type of uh, of approach that we have at the moment on the marine litter to to uh, to encompass some of the aspects of the biodiversity. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Victor, for for raising this. Um, you are exactly right. A, a more and more effort nowadays is focused on marine di marine biodiversity, and. Uh, so marine litter should play a, a big, big, bigger role in this aspect um, it, because it's really part of the ecosystem and uh, it's harmful. It could also be a habitat for many marine animals. Um, so in that regard, uh, we also need more spectral bands. That's my opinion. To quantify the different floating matters, different types of marine litter. Um, I'm not sure if I'm on the point. Um, I may have missed your point, Victor. Uh, yeah, yes, no, uh, my, my point was mainly, uh, we at the moment have this uh, community which is uh, focusing very narrowly on, uh, on marine litter and, uh, uh, and trying to, to define requirements there. But if, if we were looking forward into the, into the further away future, like uh, 10 years time, uh, would we want to uh, to uh, to expand uh, or the requirements uh, and to encompass uh, the marine the, the marine biodiversity one, or is it better if each uh, community uh, sort of uh, follows their own path and we will connect at some point in the future anyway? <laughs> but uh, oh, well, that, that's a great question. Um, I think that the answer should be yes, um, because marine litter, even if let's say we have a, a map, a very precise map of marine litter distribution, so what? I mean, how is marine litter related to marine biodiversity? And it, it, it must have an impact on this, either ephemeral or persistent, it should have an impact. So what is the relationship with the marine biodiversity? Biodiversity. I don't know if anybody has looked into this yet, uh, but that's that's a great question, and uh, that I think is the future because um, for, we have talked about this reason. Another reason is um, I think some speakers have talked about this already. Um, so even if we don't detect marine litter itself, we can detect the 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 the, the environment that is likely to have marine litter, right? A marine front, a convergence zone, all those. That's related to marine litter, and that, that is also related to marine biodiversity. Yeah. So in other words, marine litter is directly and indirectly related to marine biodiversity, and we should connect with that community. I know there's a, a MBOM uh, network, you know, Marine observ uh, Diversity Observing Network. Um, so this group, this community, the Marine Leader community should connect to that community. Yes. Yes, is exactly what I'm. Uh, I'm thinking of doing uh, very, <laughs> very soon, like next week. But <laughs> I uh, and I know that uh, you're involved in that uh, discussion. But I think it is worth uh, that uh, uh, this 
community of marine litter also is is aware of what is going on and, and progress uh, in parallel and, and in convergence uh, with uh, with the other uh, as uh, as especially if, if we're talking about floating matter marine litter is just one of those uh, parts of the floating uh, aspects that can be uh, in uh, found there so yes thank you very much shamin uh, well, thank you. I have spoken too much. <laughs> it, it is okay. We we are already uh, having a more relaxed discussion in this in this part, so no, not to worry. And uh, actually, uh, this is one of the bullet points. Also, we 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 have seen rising during the during the meeting, which is the the international coordination, including outside of the remote sensing area. So uh, we should. Uh, not limit ourselves to think just in the liter and we should not just uh, limit ourselves in the remote sense. And there is a, a cross, uh, uh, how to call it, uh, uh, there is a, a crossing road uh, with other communities and we should try to take a disadvantage. Uh, in particular, if we want to uh, develop a specific or a missions. So one of the points I like from what uh, uh, Shamin uh, has, has highlighted is that uh, one of the concerns uh, that uh, we could hear in some, some of the satellite activities was that uh, there is a belief that uh, remote sensing cannot provide the data with sufficient, uh, um, uh, how to say this, frequency in terms of time. And uh, well, we can, we can see that that, that is not a technological limitation actually uh, it is just a, a current uh, limitation because of most of the constellations of satellites or uh, single missions they are not um, being designed for 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 those frequencies but it is feasible from the technical point of view and uh, if there is a, a strong need from from the from the users and stakeholders who get daily information about uh, plastic uh, pollution or marine debris pollution, that is also something that can be embraced by the remote sensing community and in particular uh, by the space agencies and the space sector in general to 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 to, uh, to embrace this this as a requirement for future for future mission design and. Uh, uh, continuing with this, uh, as I was saying before, uh, anybody has any other question uh, or comment to do uh, before we go to the final comments? No? Then I want to, to thank you to, to our panelists and I would like to, uh, because we are benefiting from from a space science representative, uh, Paolo. Uh, do you want to make a particular statement from the from your side uh, in terms of uh, what has been discussed in this breakout session that uh, you could uh, perhaps uh, uh, take uh, take home uh, for, for for your peers to discuss into? Thank you, Manuel, for uh, passing uh, the floor. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you all. I am actually uh, honored to, to, to be involved in the, such a committee that I feel uh, is, uh, is growing. Uh, it's grown uh, in the last uh, four or five years uh, very rapidly. And I see now is uh, starting to networking more and more, uh, creating uh, expert groups and uh, organizing, having more and more uh, deeper discussion on the topic. So um, well, my takeaway is that it is that uh, the community is growing and there is uh, more and more interest at many different levels. And this is, uh, of course, uh, an important input for, uh, for an agency to, you know, to elaborate and process it in a way to eventually and possibly support it. Uh, so that's what I can, uh, I can provide from my side. And uh, I think uh, uh, we need to continue, you researchers need to continue uh, what you are doing. There is uh, still a lot of things uh, that can be explored. I see that more we advance and discuss and more we see, um, yeah, branching in a also different uh, research possibility that were not envisioned before. Uh, we are already starting to discuss about uh, a new sense or even new mission, something that uh, 
three, four years ago was, uh, was uh, received with laughs. So I, I really perceive uh, the flow of things that is uh, you know, going in a very interesting direction. And uh, yeah, it's not only a uh, scientific interest, it's also uh, an interest that uh, I see more and more uh, uh, at very different level of society. Uh, now, as we know also with the large uh, uh, United Nations ministerial initiative. So definitely is something that we need to explore, uh, especially because there is the request. Eh? So there is a demand to explore and it's also our responsibility to try to guide this effort in the best possible way in order to optimize the money and, uh, and the time. So I, I, I welcome your effort and I invite you to continue working in this direction. And uh, from my side as a representative of a funding agency, I will uh, do what I can to, to support. And thank you very much for the very nice uh, discussion today. We should actually make uh, more of this kind of discussion. I think we never have the time to go deeper and uh, hear so many experts at the same time. Thank you very much, Paolo. We, we should not forget that uh, within the commitments of uh, what we established for the United Nations will be to try to do this type of meetings more recurrent. And uh, within the objectives of the Decade of Action, uh, actually we have a mandate to try to have means and tools to continue progressing and exchanging within the community. So uh, we shall hope that this is going to be uh, an initial meeting of a series of meetings, which uh, we will have chance to, to bring uh, again uh, the community from users and stakeholders that are interested in, in bringing remote sensing technologies so we can continue to learn from them and also to present uh, what are the evolution uh, of the remote sensing techniques and how they can cope with those with those needs. And finally, to uh, determine what are the needs uh, that we have as a remote sensing community to continue improving and achieving the uh, needs and objectives from those end users and societal partners, which at the end are the ones who can put in place uh, the, the real measurements, the, the real changes uh, and actions to really achieve uh, this objective of a clean ocean by 2030. And uh, with this statement, I think uh, it's uh, the time to thank you, all of you, for your presence, uh, for your presence during these days, for all your presentations, your uh, very active participation. It has been extremely useful, everything that you have been uh, doing during these days and all the contributions that we have received. I thank you very much. Be aware that the videos and the padlets uh, that we have been sharing during these days are going to be available. Uh, there is already some information in the chat uh, for, for you to follow up on this. So the videos will be there. And we welcome, for sure, out of all of you, uh, uh, any kind of comments, uh, additional inputs that you want to do, contributions. If any person from the audience is, is willing to, 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 to add to the mass of the decadal action, feel free to reach out and, uh, and contact us. Uh, we are reachable through the IOCCD Task Force for Remote Sensing of Marine Debris and, and Plastic litter. but uh, you can also, of course, uh, discuss uh, directly with any of the participants and our panelists, which they will be more than happy to, to help you to, 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 to be part of this, of this movement. And uh, finally, I want to thank you also to the organization of the, of the IT aspects uh, of this, uh, of this uh, satellite activity that uh, has been possible thanks to, to Air Center, which very kindly has provided all the means, technical means and personnel to, to make this happen. And uh, I must say, it has been an awesome work and um, they have done a lot of efforts on this. And uh, we have been uh, very fortunate to be able to enjoy uh, these two days of discussions with a seamless interface, uh, which is always quite a challenge with a large number of participants. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we will see you in the coming uh, months, uh, whereas by your direct contact to us or in the next events that we will organize. So please stay tuned and please stay connected.